morning, everyone. Uh, before I begin, I think that it's important that we just take a moment and that we ask the Holy Spirit's assistance because apart from the Holy Spirit, apart from revelation, we can't, we can't really receive the way that we were intended to receive. So let's just pray for a moment. Father, Jesus, Holy Spirit. Pray that Holy Spirit you administer to us that we might be able to see Jesus. That we might be able to receive him for who he truly is. Give us a deeper understanding than the understanding that we could ever get from our minds and help us to understand in the heart, in our heart of hearts, Lord, the very depth of who we are. Holy Spirit, speak your word over us and in us. That we may glorify the Son and the Father in your own name. Amen. So I'm going to look at this passage in Matthew 16 again <clears throat> and uh, make some comments. We'll see what happens here. Jesus said to them, but who do you say that I am? This is uh, verse 15 in chapter 16. Some in Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail, prevail over it. Then Jesus said to him, to his disciples, excuse me, we're going to verse 24. If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. From that time, verse 21, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but on man's. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, <clears throat> take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. So we repeat that same section over again. So how is it that <clears throat> the confession of Peter and what Jesus is looking for in the confession, what's that have to do with being church? Because Jesus said that it's upon the confession of Peter that he's going to build his church. So that's the first question. Jesus is asking who he is. Peter gives a response, and the response is accurate, but he's not understanding something clearly. And what he's not understanding something is that what he was saying was so significant that you won't get it unless you're willing to die for it. You don't get the confession unless you're willing to die for what you just said. Well, Peter didn't understand that because he rebukes Jesus for saying he must die. He's saying, no, you're wrong. You, you, you shouldn't die, you're the Messiah. He has an understanding of what it means to be the king. This is the Hebrew word for the anointed one. He has an understanding of what it means to be king, which is popular in the time, which is supposed to be the king that sits upon the throne and exudes the glory of God and subdues all the enemies of God. And that's what Peter's looking for. Peter's looking for that now. And he's not thinking that that has anything to do with anybody suffering or anybody dying, let alone Jesus, who is supposed to be the king. 
But Peter is saying you have a problem. This is the problem that many have today that would confess Christ. The problem is, is they're saying the right thing, but at the same time, they're focused on man's interests and not God's interests. In other words, they have in mind a life plan, how it's supposed to work out. And then when they make the confession, they're going to somehow make a connection between my life plan and God, Jesus, helping me fulfill it. How many people have misunderstood the under, uh, Jesus' claim that he gives life and he gives it abundantly, and by that they think they mean, you know, my life is going to be full and brimming with joy and peace, and I'm going to, it's just going to be a wonderful life. It's like euphoria. And what they're thinking is, my life is going to be successful. Because, you know, I, I give my life to Jesus, and he's going to do that for me. Like Peter. Peter is saying, Jesus, here's my plan, which I think is your plan, right? And I'm going to give it to you. Now execute it, and let's see the glory. But the passage in John 10, 10, which talks about the abundant life, is this. Abundant life is living in God. It's knowing God. It's living for God. It's God himself. The abundant life is God himself. It's not something that we do on this earth that is more fun, more enjoyable, because we've seasoned it with God. But it's because we understand that there is no other life except God himself. Man's interest, we're always trying to find a way where we can connect what we want from what Jesus is saying. And the problem with that is, is you miss revelation. You'll never, ever get it. We'll never understand really what God is trying to say as long as we still have our own life plan. If you're understanding Jesus correctly, what you'll understand is it's going to mean a death. Jesus said, I have to die. I have to die for your sin. I have to die for your small little life that is bound by yourself, aimed at what you want in life. I've got to die so that you not live that because that is a dead end that just ends in a grave and is just over. There's nothing to that life. I've come so that you might enter into my life, which is full, which is larger than any of your ideas or plans. Your ideas and plans don't even get close to what I desire for you and why I'm here. But you have to be, you have to be clear about this. If you follow me, your life, according to your plans, according to your desires, according to what your mama says, according to what your church counselor uh, might say, or your high school counselor might say, or your boss might say, or what you would like. Apart from knowing and living in God, that, that life's got to end. It's got to end. Because if it doesn't end and we don't see the need for it to end, we will not receive the revelation that the life that God has for us is so full and so rich because it's all about knowing him and living in him and experiencing him and walking in close fellowship with him, that that life is so abundant and full, you're thinking this other life that you possibly could make on the earth in comparison is just trash. It's just nothing. So the question is asked to us, you know, like, who do you say that I am? And society has an answer. You know, you're, you know, that about G who Jesus is, and it, 
and somehow makes him look like a good guy and he has good plans and he helps people and, and he might heal people and things like that. But he's never the, the king of the universe, the one who will judge the living and the dead. That's never in, in the society's understanding of who Jesus is. What is our understanding? Now, what is our understanding in our heart? Because we know what the right answer is in our head. I mean, Jesus is saying, I'm it. I'm God. I'm in the flesh, but I am the eternal son of God. And I will judge the heavens and the earth. And I had to come. And you need me more than you need anything else. Because you are under a curse. You're under demonic oppression so that your best thinking, man's thinking, will damn you, will lead you to live a futile life as if I was not it, the Son of God, the Son of Man, the creator of the heavens and the earth, as if I am not significant as if I am not the most important being and so great that I am. You'll want to deny your life according to your plans. You'll want to do that to be able to enter into this life. And I'm saying you have to do that. People don't like that part. You have to. Jesus is saying, you're not going to really get who I am. You might as well just shut that off or something. I don't know. Whatever. <laughs> it is. Okay. Very well. That's okay. It's no problem either way. Jesus is saying, if you won't really get who I am, unless you follow me and you don't follow your plans anymore. Because you can't, you, can't, you can't possibly do that. See, here's the thing. <clears throat> Apart from, this is not just a one-time thing. Like, okay, I've decided for Jesus Christ, and I, I'm going to deny myself, I'm going to follow him. Because, see, the, that doesn't really explain that what Jesus is inviting us to is their ongoing relationship. So that's why one of the gospel writers says that you pick up your cross daily and follow me. It's not just a one-time thing. And what that means is picking up the cross. It means like, you know what? This cross that I'm carrying reminds me I'm not living for now. I'm not living for comfort. I'm living for God. I get to be with God. I get to be formed by God. I know God, and I keep knowing him better. And the life that I had before is a life that can't receive this revelation. But now I see it because I've given it all up. And, and that's what Jesus is saying, that you really do need to give it all up entirely. See, the reality is, if you don't see how significant he is, you're not going to follow him. Because there are other things to do that are more interesting, you think. Paul, excuse me, Peter thought that his idea was a great idea. But Peter, your idea is so puny compared to what Jesus had in mind. What you even understand glory to be is mixed up. Who you understand him to be is mixed up. Jesus says in Matthew 10, 38, something similar. He says, He who has affections for father or mother 
more than me is not worthy of me. And he that has affections for son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And the word there is affections. It's not agape love. It's, it's like this, you know, love of warmth, good feeling. So Jesus is saying, if your good feelings are more potent for your children, for your husband or your wife, if that is what has a pull on your life, let me make this clear, you're not worthy of me. Now, that, you might think that sounds harsh, but it really isn't at all. Because do you know what we're saying if we were to say that? That, you know, my, my affection for something or someone else is greater than the Lord? It would be saying, because I'm more significant than you are, Jesus. I don't think, I don't think that you are worthy of my life. I have my own plans for my life. I don't think your idea is as valuable, as worthwhile, as my idea for my life. So, Jesus said, you're not worthy of me because you don't get it. He's saying, you're not worthy of me. You cannot follow me because you are into something else. That's why Jesus could say this. Unless you are ready to die for me, you can't live for me. You think that's true? Some people think, oh, I don't know if I could ever die for him. Well, then you need to rethink who Jesus, the Son of God, the Christ, who he really is. That's what Jesus is saying. I am so significant. But you see, according to the way man thinks, I'm not that significant. Because Jesus has a place. Maybe Jesus has even a big place. But why doesn't he have all of the place? Why not just everything? That's what Jesus is saying. And the answer is, well, if I give him everything, it's going to cut deep into my life. And I have a life. And Jesus is saying, no, you don't. That's why I'm here. You don't have a life without me. You are under satanic oppression. You are separated from me. I made you. I made you. I made you from love for me. And you will never know what love is, never know what life is, apart from just entirely giving yourself to me. Jesus is obviously not against having affections for people or affections for your family. That's not really the problem. The problem is what he says is, more than me. More than. When we don't want to give him everything, at that point, isn't it true? At that point, we're saying, I'm more significant. This plan that I have, this idea that I have, the way I've contoured my life to a particular end, that's more important. So that's why Jesus just says the truth back to us. You're not worthy of me. And, and we say back, in that resistance, you're not worthy of me. Which is exactly what Satan says. See, it's a worship issue. Peter's plan and Satan's plan, as we've said before, you know, there's a lot of parallels. They work together. Let's forget the cross. Let's forget the death. Let's forget any suffering involved. And let's just get on with the glory. But really what Peter is saying, Jesus, I want you to rule for me. I don't want a rule under you. I have a plan about the rule. And I want that plan in place. And that's exactly what Satan said. I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. 
if you'll fall down and worship me. And what he's suggesting, the very same thing to Peter. We're saying to Jesus, I'm going to follow you if you give us what we want. No death, no suffering, and a life that I can shape. I'll lay the tracks. Jesus, you provide the power to go down those tracks. And Jesus said, no, no, you follow me. You follow my path. You don't lay your own tracks. Those tracks are going to go in a circle until eventually you wear out, you die, and it's over. Your life is over. But my life, if you follow me, that is, if you are close to me, and you're willing to give up the illusion of a life outside of God, which is the most powerful illusion that Satan has put upon human beings, that they can actually have a life without being close to God. If you, if you give up that deceit and you follow me, you'll have a life that I think you're worthy of. And that life is my own life. I, will, I in fact, have offered my own life for you. So we can't think that when Jesus said, you can't follow me unless you give everything, it's like, well, you haven't mustered up enough effort, you haven't prayed enough, you haven't been involved in church enough or community enough, so, you know, you're just not, didn't make the team. He's saying, everyone can, can join me, but you have to understand how significant I am. The eternal one is right in front of you. And this one you will see again. And I will be on a throne. There will be angels around me. And you will come and stand before me. And the majority of the judgment is, what have you done with me? Because I have given you myself. What have you done with my love? Did you try to fit it into your plan? Then you think that I am really insignificant. But here we are, and it's clear. My life is in time and outside of time. And you're only thinking, you're only giving your best, your energy and your emotions, your time, and your talents and your efforts for only the in lifetime. And so you didn't understand who I was. So Jesus said, let's build church. It's really simple. You don't even have to rent a hall. You don't have to have people skilled in music or a preacher. The core of it, there are other things that are to echo this truth, but the core of it is give up your life. Show that you know who I am so that you can actually be a part of my assembly. Give it all up. And yes, embrace suffering too. It's a suffering that gives life to your soul and to the souls of others. It's not suffering for no purpose, like the life that you would live outside of me. Honor my love, my sacrifice, my presence. Giving your whole life for my life is wisdom, is salvation freedom, forgiveness, communion in a deep level with God. And you were made for that. You were made for something very, very noble, something much greater than whatever you could cobble together on the earth with your creativity. Be inspired by a God who would sacrifice everything to make you worthy. And let your response without any condition, any footnote, be full and complete. Lord, well, where else can I go for words of eternal life?
Lord, who else is there but you? Brothers and sisters, meditating on this passage and asking the Holy Spirit to bring it alive to us is cleansing. And I would encourage you to do that. What is life about? What place does this, does this revelation of Jesus, what part of our lives are gripped by that and led by that? The more and more that we can give ourselves to the truth, the more and more we get light and life, wisdom, and we can ac accurately reflect the very purpose for our own life that God gave to us. Amen.